Hey, here we go. Today is Sunday, February 5th, 2023. God, it's like the future. And this is episode 270 of the Defensive Security Podcast. My name is Jerry Bell, and joining me today, as always, is Mr. Andrew Kellett. Hello, Jerry. How are you, sir? It's been a, it's been a minute. It has been a minute. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm getting through the winter, you know. Glad I'm not in places where it's like negative 110 degrees right now, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. We seem to be setting records in, uh, sanity, it, for cold. Sanity afoot. But uh, I'm, I'm good. Thank, thanks, for, thanks for having me today. Absolutely. Glad to be here. So it's been a while. Um, by my calculations, almost six months, maybe a little longer than six months. I kind of forget how we do this kind of thing. Well, t- it took me the better part of an hour to get all of my audio crap working again. A little bit of rust. Yeah. Kind of sweep away the cobwebs. But here and we are. So, yeah. And so why exactly has it been six months? Well, two reasons. Yeah. Well, I mean, probably more than two reasons. But uh, one reason, obviously, is just work is um, much more intense than, uh, you know, I anticipated, and uh, and may- maybe the other more um, more timely reason is uh, Twitter went to hell, and I got very very busy with my uh, Mastodon instance. I've heard a little something about this thing, this extinct woolly elephanty <laughs> thing that you're doing. Yes, yeah, that's been uh, quite exciting. Uh, I- well, maybe. Maybe we should talk a little bit about that. I know it's not our typical topic, but sure. you know, it seems to be people seem to be interested in that. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, so infosec.exchange is the, uh, the the domain name. And I set that up, uh, gosh, it's been, I think, almost six years ago. And, uh, you know, it was one of those little experimentation things, and I... It had a little, very, very, very small community of people on it, just a, a handful for the better part of five years until Elon Musk announced he was buying Twitter. And back in about, about this time last year, maybe a little bit later, and uh, there was a there was an initial wave of people that came over and I ended up having to move off of the crappy little cheap VPS I was using to a more substantial server and I actually thought that was going to be it. Like it was a it was a much larger server, and I figured like I'd never outgrow that until October. I was actually working at my beach place, and Twitter my Twitter alert started going bananas while I was at a, on a meeting. And um, yeah, uh, that was when um, the, the the sale of Twitter closed, and people started jumping ship and. There was all sorts of discussion about people migrating from Twitter over to uh, to Mastodon. Yeah, uh, there was some drama around whether or not that sale was even going to close, but it, it seemed like a whole lot of people then didn't want to be on Twitter anymore. And suddenly, after six years, your your little site became an overnight success. Yeah, yeah, it went from went from about a hundred and eighty active. Use monthly users, so like over the course of a month, 180 different people would log in to um, to 40, 42,000 in the course of about six weeks. Wow! And um, it was it was a very exciting time of scaling and learning about um, performance tuning the innards of Linux, like I had never never known before. Because for those who don't know, this is all running on boxes you own, right? That you're running. You're like you. This infrastructure isn't someplace else. You you set it up and operate it. Correct. Correct. Is that a um, it's at a data center provider in Germany actually mm. uh, that that rents 
so it's, I mean, they're rentals, but they're bare metal servers that, that I that I rent, and they're I, I use it. The company is called Hetzner, and I use them because they're you know they're basically the most cost effective that I can find. There's nothing particular that I love about them, although their service has been pretty good and they're cheap and, and reliable. So you're running a bare metal box to run on as opposed to like a, a shared resource, like a typical cloud provider. Correct. Interesting. And that's beneficial. Why? Because that seems to be contrarian to the entire cloud model everybody else is pitching these days. Why go bare metal? So holy cow, the CISO of a cloud company is running bare metal servers. I know. Right. Like, Let's also talk about that for a second, that you're, you're not only doing this, you're also working approximately 7,000 hours a week uh, as CISO of a massive company. So, yeah, you're a little busy. It, it has been busy, and hence why we haven't recorded a podcast in a while. That's fair. Um, so so a couple couple things. One is it's cheap. And, and two is it is really difficult to achieve the level of performance that you can get on a bare metal system with a with a, a shared cloud resource. Even like with a hyper scaled yeah. elastic. Yeah. It, it, so, so the answer is you could probably get there, but it would be Ooh. far more expensive. Interesting. So, uh, you know, for example, I'm, you know, I, well, at, at, at one point the, um, <laughs> the grand estate that was infosec that exchange uh, took it 16 bare metal servers. It was a very, very, very large. I mean, because we had, we had at one point uh, around twelve thousand concurrent people connected at any given time. So it was, <laughs> you know, it was a pretty heavy load, um, and it's down considerably from there. It's about four thousand now, and so I'm actually consolidated down to two two servers: a thirty-two core and a sixteen core, um, which is a little a little bit cheaper. And easier to manage, uh, but you know, to, to get that same level of performance, it would have cost me two or three times what it what it costs to, to you know to go over on onto a cloud provider. Now, the one you know the 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 better, I guess the the advantage over there is it's easier to scale. Like if I wanted to add CPUs, I don't have to to rehome, um, and you know if it's um, can be not always can be more uh, more reliable. Hmm. Interesting. So you, you mentioned a little bit of, of load of, of users. You mentioned you peaked at, what, 42,000? Now, now you're back down to around four? Well, so... The, Concurrent? There, well, the, there's I think we're almost at 49,000 total accounts. Oh, wow. But now, um, you know, not, not all of the... There's people that have created accounts... They logged in, they dabbled with it, and then they haven't come back. Hmm. And and so we're, if you look at the number of active accounts over the past month, we're at just over just between twenty five and twenty six thousand. Wow. Uh, and and we're but at any at any given time, right now there's about four thousand people connected. So for those that joined didn't come back. Is that because you sent them your really scary welcome video that you're still sending to everybody that I keep telling you is frightening to small children? It could be. I mean, look, they have to understand what they're getting into. You're setting appropriate expectations. Correct. With clowns, which again, I keep <laughs> telling you. And balloons. Yes. And llamas. And llamas. Very frightening. <clears throat> so <laughs> I feel, I feel like I'm suddenly doing an interview. So what is it that you think drove people – I don't want to get into politics or anything, but what is it you think that that everybody sort of abandoned or at least the subset who chose to come over to Exchange? Why do you think they left Twitter and went over there and then some appear to be going back? Or like what do you think is behind all that movement? It's a, it's a really good question. I think there's a couple of things. Um, one is there's certainly a political aspect. There's a lot of – you know, I mean, look, you can't, for right or wrong, there's a lot of people who don't like the politics of the new management, and we're we're uh, really concerned about the the moves that Twitter made in terms of uh, purging people, and so I think there were or employees, and there were concerns about the 
you know, the viability of Twitter going forward. And so people didn't want to lose um, the community that they built. And, and I think there were also one of the biggest pops of, of new accounts happened after Twitter announced that they basically purged their safety team. And, and so mm, interesting. Um, I think there were quite a few people who just kind of lost faith, but at the same time, you know, the, the network effect is real. And so when you ha- when you have a, you know, a, a population of people that move from one platform to another, other, they'll drag other people who might not otherwise have been interested in moving along with them because those other people want to be where the others are at. They want to sure. be part of the community. Yeah, I saw a lot of big names, you know, straight up announcing that they were leaving Twitter for good and going over to various Mastodon accounts or other social media sites. And yeah, I'm sure people who follow those people uh, were motivated to potentially try it out for the first time and see what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I do think that there was a lot of people, you know, look, it's, I, I, I would have a hard time quantifying. Right. But I think there's, there's quite a few people who came over expecting complete parity with what Twitter had to offer in terms of search and, you know, all of the other features, usability features, which just aren't there, you know, and there's some design points of, of Mastodon and other, other, uh, Fediverse software that, that are, um, not popular, or I should say, uh, are, 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 missing features that some people have come to expect, right? And so, for example, um, you know, the, the quote tweets and, and um, you know, more effective search are, are, are historically seen on the Fediverse as uh, enabling harassment. And so, so both of those things have been, uh, you know, pretty slimmed down or completely not present at all. You can argue whether that's the case or not, but look, I mean, the, that's the design choices of the people that wrote the software. And so um, that's that's where it's at. Interesting. So it's been an adventure, to say the least. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> uh, it's been fun. Um, the community has been just fantastic. And actually, that's what has been the most interesting part to me was helping to... Um, to facilitate, you know, the the ongoing community that that had been built up on Twitter, I saw it. You know, I look. It was a pr- pretty personally taxing uh, to to do this over the past couple of months, but I, you know, I, I thought that the the infosec community that had been built up on Twitter was worth was worth um, trying to save and and help find a, a, a landing spot. So what's been, you know, so surprising about that or, or so what's caught you by surprise or what have you learned going through that process? Um, how ephemeral the platform is like, you know, that, that people can just up and quit Twitter mm-hmm. after a decade or, or more. Um, that that's, um, been one, you know, it's, it's really, about the, the the interpersonal connections that a lot of the people have, that and you know, there, look, there's there's a lot of strong personalities too, um, and 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 so having um, having to moderate that has also been pretty fun. How has that gone on the moderation front? I mean, Twitter had massive teams and you know lots of people and a whole bunch of external inputs from advertisers and other places. That sort of fed into that? Like, how, how are you thinking about moderation? Um, so I, you know, I set up, set out some rules for the server and I try to live by, when I get complaints from people, I, I, I try to, um, apply those rules to whether or not the behavior is, you know, is, is acceptable or not. Um, one thing I did have to do fairly early on and it wasn't necessarily because of people on the instance. It was because of um, during the kind of the expansionary phase, there were lots of other troll instances that were just like 
har- you know, outright harassing uh, people that were moving over indiscriminately, just like, um, just just uh, harassing, um, you know, with pretty uh, pretty vile name calling. And oh. so I so I had to uh, I had to enlist the help of some volunteers to help moderate, and and that has been probably one of the best decisions of the whole the whole process to to uh, select the people that I did. They've been absolutely fantastic. Well, that's cool. Yeah, because I can imagine as it gets busier and busier, uh, that doesn't scale for one person very well unless you want to try to automate it, which has its own set of problems. Yeah, it's it's actually not been so bad lately. You know, it it is a definitely a function of the volume of people that are active. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, right now we're we probably have maybe two or three or four complaints a day. So hmm. It's not not awful. I'll uh, I'll work on fixing that for you. Hang on, I'm give sure, me a minute. I'm sure you will. <laughs> I'm sure you will. So yeah, it's been fun. It's uh you know and and look, there's a bunch of other um, tangentially related services like uh, you know there's a Fediverse native blog which I set up uh, on a site called infosec.press and then there's a a video site which is kind of like YouTube I guess you best comparison. Hmm. I created one of those on um, uh, video.infosec.exchange, and then I set up a, a picture sharing service, which is kind of like, um, I was going to say Picasso. God, that shows how old I am. <laughs> like Flickr? <laughs> like Flickr, Flickr yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's on, that's on pixel.infosec.exchange. And, you know, I keep, keep adding things as, as time goes on. It's been, uh, it's been kind of fun helping, um, Helping to to drive uh, the buzz and interest in in the community. So, for those who don't know, including me, when you use the term "fediverse," what what does that mean typically? Uh, a, like, what are we talking about? Sure, sure. So, Mastodon is just a it's just one bit of software that participates in this. I don't want to call it a peer to peer network, but it's an overlay network on the internet using a protocol called activity pub. And, and basically it's a message sharing protocol rides on top of HTTPS. And, um, you know, it's, it, it is what enables messages like what you see, you know, with, with, uh, with, with Mastodon as an example, it's kind of like a Twitter like, but not, not direct replacement as we talked about before, but you can send messages back and forth. Uh, to to other people, but unlike Twitter, it's you know each each um, in, there's a, there's a, a network of instances that are independently owned and operated you know, by uh, by different people with different sets of rules on different domain names. And in that way, by the way, it's much more like email. Mm. So you can think of it uh, in in many ways as being like a, a more real time email. But if I log in to you, infosec.exchange, can I view posts on other Mastodon instances? If, if the answer is it depends. Okay. <laughs> it, 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 it definitely depends on uh, if you follow them, if you follow the, the people on the other instance, if your instance participates in a relay server that the other instances participate in, um, if you follow somebody else that boosts one of their posts that that'll also show up in your, your timeline. So um, if, you know, if you have no connections in common between y- yourself and your instance and someone else in their instance, uh, probably not. You wouldn't, hmm. you wouldn't see them unless you knew their handle and then you could go search for it and find them and follow them. And, and then that connection is made. Uh, but you know, it's one of the advantages, I and mean, this it's such a fascinating ecosystem. Because on the one hand, it's really intended to be, uh, you know, a highly federated environment with lots of little instances that are that are that are all um, kind of uh, managed at a at a very local level uh, to you know to, to spread out the moderation and and. and uh, rule out single points of failure and whatnot. But on the other hand, 
if you're on a small instance, you mm-hmm. don't get to see a lot of traffic. You're, you're kind of off on an island. And so there's a, a definite advantage to being on a large instance, a large active instance, because you get to see lots of, uh, lots of traffic because, you know, that all of those people on your instance follow people on other instances. And so you get to see, you know, their, their interactions. Yeah. That network effect that, mm-hmm. uh, seems to matter so much in social media sites. Absolutely. Yeah. That is interesting. So you as the admin, do you choose which sites to federate with? Is it just like a, a like a global root server that's telling you about all the other federated possibilities or how does how do they all know about each other? Um, so there is no global root server. When you set up a server, it it has no particular knowledge of any other server. So you, the, the thing that makes it known is that you you have to follow somebody on a on another instance Hmm. and once you follow that other instance then you start to see posts from them and responses they make to other people and and um and and it just kind of builds from there then then you're and to answer your first question by default it you're everybody is federating with everybody else you know again if those connections are made, uh, but you can block, um, you know, you, you can, it's, it's more painful to set it up as, as a allow list versus a blacklist, but, Mm -hmm. um, typically it works more on the blacklist principle than, than the allow list. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I clearly, I don't know anything about the underlying mechanics, but, um, fascinating. Yeah. It's been, been pretty interesting. Any other uh, key things on area you want to talk about? Because I'm just kind of probing around and I, I didn't do any prep work for this. So I'm not sure if you've got some other cool topics you want to share. So it was, you know, I was thinking about what what I've learned since yeah. the last, um, I mean, not necessarily just associated with, with um, you know, infosec.exchange, but just in, in general hmm. over the past six months. And, you know, the, uh, there's been a, Obviously, a whole lot of news has happened in that time, and I'm not even going to try to recount all the stuff that has happened from CISOs getting, uh, you know, tried criminally to, uh, you know, more APT stuff, and and obviously the the heating heating up war in in uh, Ukraine, but kind of on a more um, pedestrian side. Been, it's it's been very interesting to watch as and again we talked a little bit about cloud right is is the adoption of cloud continues I've said this before and I'm starting to see it come to fruition some of the, you know, the there's new attack types that we really hadn't had to worry about before starting to come you know into into full view and uh, one of those has to do with API credentials. Before you go any further, we should note our disclaimer. Oh yeah, yeah. The uh, thoughts and opinions <laughs> we express are ours and do not represent those of our employers. Uh, but right. but look, you know, there's, I'm not going to say anything that is, uh, I don't think any you know, very controversial. But you know, there's a there's a lot of. Um, well, a lot of risk associated with the use of cloud-based API keys that you didn't have to worry about in kind of traditional IT. And, and the, the, a, big, a big reason for that, I think, is uh, it's difficult to know all the places that they're hiding. And the access an adversary needs to, to leverage them if they do find them is often like just hanging out on the internet. Right? You, you, as soon as you find a key, quite often the endpoint that that key can use is readily available to you, wherever you are. And and so that's a, uh, you know, it's kind of an exciting area of uh, of uh, attacker defender innovation right now. 
So in many ways, it's almost like these API keys are just static passwords that are being set. Yeah. And once discovered, have often huge amounts of permission. And often the endpoint for that API is not protected in any way from the internet. So once you get the API key, you can do whatever that API key grants without really much other problem. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And there doesn't seem to be, at least in my experience, nearly as rich of a cultural understanding that that is indeed, for lack of a better term, a password that should be protected tightly, uh, as opposed to an enablement of almost, at least what I've seen with a lot of folks, they treat the API keys almost like an identifier that they just note it in, you know, their script, or they note it in the text file, or they don't protect it nearly as tightly as they probably should if they really realized this was truly a passcode or password type enablement feature. Yeah, exactly. And so, so you know, we see a lot of these, uh, a lot of this coming into uh, uh, um, adversary hands through mm-hmm. things like open source contributions. Mm. Or they're accidentally committed to like yeah. GitHub or something. Because like you said, um, people don't necessarily think about, uh, you know, all the code, uh, you know, the, the way that they're writing their code and potentially hard coding these API keys and, and, and then, um, you know, committing them into github.com. And that's, a, you know, that's a big problem. And the bad guys are getting very adept at finding those. And it's also, by the way, uh, further problematic because even if you do realize that you accidentally committed that key and then you commit a new version of your code without the key, that history is still there yeah. in, your, in your code repo. It never goes away. And then how difficult is it to rotate that key? Right, right. Which often is for, I mean, that probably is the initial reaction people would have to hearing this. It's just, well, just rotate the key. Well, what I've found at least is that that is far more complicated than you think it would be. Yeah. And yeah, there's a is, lot of friction to that. It is. Um, it, it's even more important in my mind than passwords or, because I think we've gotten maybe a little, maybe I'm a little naive on this, but you know, we, we don't often see passwords being just uploaded willy nilly to the internet like we do API keys. Uh, it, it, but I think it's really important as we are designing systems. And when I say we, I mean, from an IT operations perspective, we, we need to be designing in, as we're building these systems, the ability to rotate those keys. And, and you know, it should be done on some periodic basis to force, you know, both the ability to do it um, and the automation so that if, you know, you do discover that it's been compromised you have you know it's not a complete panic you you can just you can go do it there's a there's a sure a a pathway to get there it's not it doesn't take extraordinary measures in a in an emergency to rotate it right and you don't break stuff right Right. that's that's also important and i think that it's that breakage that causes a lot of hesitation when you know when you're faced with the prospect of having to rotate the keys or perhaps even the unknown aspect of we're not sure what this is going to break because mm. we don't know where all this key is being used. Right. Yes. Which seems like its own problem. Yes. But, you know, if we get into this concept of, you know, for lack of a better term, rotate your keys every 90 days, then eventually NIST is going to come out and say, no, you don't need to do that anymore. And then we're going to get into the circular argument. <laughs> That's right. You're right. <laughs> Sorry. You're right. Part, I think part of the reason that this is becoming a big problem is that I, I don't think there's a great, um, you know, like on, on, on passwords, like we've, we've basically admitted defeat on passwords. And so we've, we've moved to multi-factor is kind of the best practice, which is why this says you don't need to change passwords anymore because it, you know, you, you should be using multi-factor. Should, should, should. should. Most people don't read. <laughs> they stop reading after. Don't rotate your passwords anymore, and they just they like that part, and not the other, Correct. other parts of the guidance. Um, but unlike unlike that, there isn't a great 
kind of unified body of standards for how to secure API keys. I mean, there certainly are ways, you know, there's things like HashiCorp Vault and most cloud providers have some, you know, proprietary way of, of handling those keys, but they're not convenient. I mean, let's just, it's not men's words, right? They aren't, they aren't super convenient. It is not as easy as just uh, committing the key into your code. Uh, but at the same time, it's pretty dangerous to do that. So what do you think about tools to detect somebody about to commit or just recently committed you know, some sort of secret in their code and alerts them on that? Or is that just closing the barn doors after the cows escaped? I think it's actually really important to do. Um, I mean, even if even if it is after the, the horse has left the barn, you, you at I least... Said, I said cow. By the way, okay. for the record. Even if, even if it's fine. The if you cow, want to use horse, we can use horse. Even That's if fine. the cow is left the barn. I'm sorry, Mr. CISO, you're correct. <laughs> we'll use your analogy. How dare I? Even if the cow has left the barn, then it, it is important to, to know uh, and, and close that window of, of ex, you know, possible exploitation. So, it's been a long time. I got to give you a little. I know. I know. I get it. I get it. You you miss me. I do. I really do. <clears throat> yeah. I, I've i been looking at this too a little bit and, and I do feel like because that aspect of once it's committed, hey, it, that that's a problem, right? I, it seems like the place to solve it is pre-commit, like some sort of pre-commit checks that say, you know, before I'm going to let you save this here, uh, this pattern matches a key. Are you sure you want to do this kind of thing? Uh, yeah. But that seems to be uh, oddly more complicated than I thought it would be. It is quite, it's, well, it's, it's, it's complicated and it's, um, it's not deterministic. Like it is, it is not like a firewall type control. Like, you know, you, you, you pass one, you know, traffic on one port and you block it on another port. It It is it is, um, you know, it's it's dependent on typically being able to identify that a string has a certain amount of entropy in it that is indicative that it's, you know, it's some kind of a secret. And yeah, uh, and which is again a at best uh, an uh, an educated guess, and so it's going to get them wrong sometimes. Is this a secret, or did your cat just crawl across your keyboard? <laughs> Or both. Or both. It could be both. Yeah, I would agree with you, though, in general, the API topic is, I feel that it's one that isn't on the radar as much as it probably should be. And we sort of enable a lot of things with APIs, but I don't think, I don't think most people understand the risks associated with these API keys as intuitively as they do, like, passwords. Right. Kind of like what I was saying earlier. Um, yeah, so I, I, I agree with you. It's something that I think we're going to see a lot more of as more and more things shift to the cloud because a lot of the times these are service accounts kind of things that are different microservices talking to each other and are deep, deep in the architecture of, of a project or a platform and rarely do they surface until they come up to bite you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it, I, I really think we have a lot of maturing to do in this area, both in terms of, you know, education and in terms of, um, you know, tooling to detect it when it, to detect that it's being committed into code, like, well, like you just, we just talked about, but I think also, uh, the kind of the, the control plane API access, like I, I, uh, I think that there's a lot of opportunities for improvement for example looking for an api call coming from a location that shouldn't happen and that being indicative that your key has been compromised and so I, you know and and you know look you know bob going back to my friend bob um you know one of the things he's done is has uh, been planting honey keys um, and and those honey keys give an indication of you know what the adversaries are trying to do when they get a when they get a key and that helps his uh, his organization you know to to figure out you know what to look at 
what to monitor. Again, it's not, you know, it's not foolproof, but I think the, the, uh, the big, um, the big change here is we, we don't know all of the ways yet, and we may never know all of the ways, right? But we don't know all the ways that the adversaries are intending or will be using these keys. You know, the, a lot of the ways that they're, they're being used right now are, are pretty benign. I mean, yeah, they can cost you some money, but typically right now they're like spinning up servers to mine Bitcoin or Monero or crap like that. Now, certainly, you know, there has been instances like what happened with Capital One where, you know, they they do something much more nefarious. But, you know, in general, it's, um, that's, that's not been the case, but that's not going to be the case for long. Sure. Right. You know, the, the, the adversaries are going to start realizing what they can do with API keys and we have to get a lot better uh, before then. Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna have problems. Yeah, I think there's a companion topic to this, which is how tidy are your APIs written. Mm-hmm. I think once people figure out that you know you've got an API, then often I have seen that the APIs there's some assumptions perhaps that maybe go into some API development of without the hacker mindset of how could this be manipulated or fussed with. And I think that that's another area that we have to grow stronger in, that our muscle is pretty weakened right now. Absolutely. That is absolutely, I think, a, a, um, hopefully we'll see the, ad, you know, the, the red team view on, on, um, on API tax mm-hmm. growing too. Um, because, you know, right, right now I, I, you know, I still think a lot of our security programs are kind of built on, old, old school IT. And sure. So, you know, we're, you know, the, uh, the, the, the typical red teamer is still thinking about things like, you know, Mimi cats and, and lateral movement with active directory. And, um, which look, I mean, those are, those are still very big problems, but I just think we're, we have a blind spot right here. Yeah, I would agree with you. I would agree with you. I, you know, about a year and a half ago, I took a, a senior role at a, cloud only SaaS only firm and it's a vastly different environment and threat landscape than the old school that i used to work in so yeah it's you know it's absolutely learning curve for both us as defenders and i think also for the attackers but the attackers have a heck of a motivation to find ways to manipulate this as more and more organizations just go full cloud first and SaaS only and I think, you know, kind of related, I think of this a little bit like the attack surface management when you when everything is SaaS based is also very complex, mm-hmm. far more so than when you had just a traditional data center environment. So yeah, we got we got some work to do there, I think. If it, if it were easy, they wouldn't need us. That's true. That's true. What other key things have been rattling around in the last six months for you? Um, the, um, you know, the, the, the amount of regulation that is sprouting up around the world related to, to, to data privacy, to um, critical infrastructure and, and, and security in general is both encouraging and alarming. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's helpful? I think it's it's helpful in so much as it forces organizations to reckon with it. You know, with mm. like you know, we we can't ignore it. We have to do something. The challenge comes down to some of the. Uh, I guess I'll call them incompatibilities in in some of the the different rules from different countries. Um, you know, what, a great example is what happened in Australia, and, and this is I'm not this is um, like third hand information, so take it for what it's worth. But you know, there, there's been a bunch of high profile data breaches there in in recent months, 
And my, it's my understanding that some of those data breaches are of data that the carriers were required to start keeping as a result of other data breaches. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's, there's the unintended consequences of, of, uh, of rules. India is another example. You know, they've, they've set out some rules related to log retention and, you know, and, and that's kind of antithetical, by the way, to what, um, what the GDPR requires. Right, which is the ability to delete all yeah. records of exactly. of certain types of information. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, there's a there's a lot of re, you know reconciliation that has to go on. I think globally, uh, if if companies are going to be able to continue to operate internationally, um, you know, I I think also by the way, there's a lot of uh, I don't want to call it weaponization. But a lot of use of these laws to help bolster local country economies. So forcing like a sovereign uh, location for whatever massive multinational company wants to do business there. Correct. Yeah, that's great. But you've got to build a data center here and run it here for you to operate in right. whatever random or, country. Or, or it can't be... You know, certain types of work can't be done by an international company. It can all be done by a uh, a company that is based in that country. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you've got a lot of economic incentive to try to capture that revenue in mm-hmm. in country. Uh, I think there was talk for a little while about some of these big multinationals like having a global tax, like a global minimum tax as well, where you had certain. Like I think we saw this. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, Ireland launched a very, very low tax rate for corporations. So a lot of corporations went and established business there and other companies were – other countries were starting to cry foul that that was driving their tax base lower. And, you know, So I, I probably a similar but different sort of problem of, of how do they capture jobs and tax base for these big multinational corporations. Mm-hmm. Which is why I just, you know, I'm just going to sell flowers, I think. That's a good plan. In my county only. It's a good plan. It gets very complicated. Uh, you know, without without sharing any details, I know that you know, the company I work for does a lot of work in, in Europe. And the amount of confusion in general still about people in Europe thinking what they think GDPR does it's interesting how often we're having to educate customers or other businesses or, you know, how we interpret it. And there's just a lot of confusion at times, Um, you know, without, I don't want to go any deeper than that, but, and I think when you start layering on more and more and more of these, there's going to be epic amount of confusion and inevitably you're going to be violating somebody's law without realizing it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is what's concerning to me. Right. Yeah. You know, you look, I, I, I may be, again, being naive here, but I think a lot of companies or most companies indeed want to comply with the law, but sure, like it has to be feasible to do so. Uh, yeah. Anyway, that's all, that's all I had. Okay. So with your crazy adventures in Mastodon land and your, Epically busy time as a CISO. How often do you think that we should set expectations that we might be able to do more of these? I think we should we should plan. You know, we should set expectations for monthly and try to over overachieve. <laughs> That's a good OKR. I like it. <laughs> well, good. I'm I. I'm glad we got a chance to at least catch up and hopefully people found this somewhat valuable. I know a little bit different than our normal format, but you probably get a lot of questions about what you've been up to and all the fun stuff you're doing, you know, Indeed, especially do. all those folks who didn't want their social media to be run by an eccentric billionaire. Now it's being run by an eccentric thousandaire with a llama interest. So that's, that's an improvement. That I is think. true. I mean, are you rich enough to be called eccentric yet or just weird? Is there is there like an income 
clip level where you go from weird to eccentric? I, I don't know. I don't know what the rule is. That's a good question. We'll do some research. We'll get our crack research team on that and figure out Maybe I where am you're just at. weird. I don't, I don't know. Well, you're my kind of weird, so that's okay. I love you. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> HR moment. <laughs> All right. <laughs> good catching up. Hopefully yep. we still got some folks out there who appreciate this and drop us a note. You can find us all sorts of places. Why don't you do say all the new fancy things? Yeah. So uh, you can find the, the, the website for the podcast at defensivesecurity.org. You can follow uh, me and Andy. You are, you are uh, Lurg at infosec.exchange and also Lurg at, on Twitter. Yes. And I am uh, Jerry on infosec.exchange and malicious link on Twitter. Although, I haven't been on Twitter and I don't know. It's been a very long time. I still have time for it anymore. That's fair. You barely have time to think. You're that a busy is, guy. That is very true. Very, <laughs> very true. I um, Look, I sincerely appreciate everybody uh, and your, your patience with us and uh, not, not having released an episode in a very, very long time. So I look forward to doing more of these soon. Thank we're you not all. dead yet. Not dead yet. Get on the cart. But we're way out of practice. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. Well, great talking to Jerry. We'll do it again soon. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.